As you have seen in previous lectures, the learning in neural networks is often done using gradient descent. The gradients are computed using backpropagation. The ability to compute gradients does not however guarantee that, that one would actually be able to use these gradients to converge to a reasonable solution. As we will see, it is very important for the relative magnitudes of the gradients uh, uh, with respect to different weights to be well conditioned in order for proper convergence to take place. Unfortunately, this is often not the case in neural network optimization. In neural network optimization, it is often the case that the magnitudes uh, of the gradients in different layers are very different. The magnitudes can either increase with increasing layer or they can decrease with decreasing layer. This, these problems are referred to as the vanishing and exploding gradient problems. In this lecture, we will examine the causes of the vanishing and exploding gradient problems and we will also discuss some partial solutions uh, to, this, to these problems. So, as you have seen in previous lectures, neural network learning is a multivariable optimization problem. During the learning process, we use backpropagation in order to compute the derivative of the loss function with respect to the weights in different layers. Unfortunately, these derivatives with respect to different weights can often have very different magnitudes. And widely varying magnitudes of the partial derivatives affect the learning. In general, when you have very different sensitivity of the loss function with respect to different features, the, uh, the, the nature of the gradient is often good for very small steps of gradient descent. The point is that the, rate, the path of steepest descent in most loss function only gives you an instantaneous direction of best movement and it is not the correct direction of descent in the longer term. In general, what you want is that the different weights have derivatives of similar magnitudes. So in order to understand the nature of the sensitivity of the loss function with respect to different features, we, we are going to look at a very simple example. So here I have shown you two examples of contour plots. Now uh, these, these contour plots really depend upon two input variables which are your x and y. And the loss function, we have shown the contour lines showing the, uh, and the contour line indicates that the value of the loss function is the same all along that contour line. So for example, the first loss function is x square plus y square. So uh, in this case, uh, we have a uh, loss function which looks like a circular bowl and the contour lines which correspond to cross sections of this bowl are perfectly circular. However, the second loss function uh, is only a minor difference of the first loss function. That is L is equal to X square plus 4Y square. So here the loss function is more sensitive to the Y attribute as compared to the X attribute. In this case, uh, you, you can see that the loss function is an elliptical ball. Now, the, uh, in the case of the contour plot, it has a property that if you take any contour line and you uh, look at the perpendicular to, the, uh, to, to that point on the contour line, what you have is the gradient because that is the path of steepest de descent because the contour line defines uh, uh, the direction along which the gradient doesn't change and the perpendicular to that defines the direction along which the gradient changes the fastest, which is the path of ste steepest descent. So uh, here you can see that in the case of the circular bowl, the path of steepest descent uh, points directly to the center of the bowl. However, in the case of the elliptical bowl, uh, the situation is very different where the path of st steepest descent never changes uh, to uh, the center of the bowl and you're typically going to bounce along. You will need many steps, many finite steps with course corrections. So this is what I meant when I said that uh, the, the path of uh, the direction of steepest descent is not the correct direction in the longer term for most loss functions. In general, when a loss function has very uh, 
different type of sensitivity to different attributes, this problem of bouncing along is more likely to happen. And this provides you the simplest example of this fact. Now note that elliptical bowls are very easily solvable using a variety of methods. But even in this very simple case, you can show you can see this behavior where varying sensitivity to different attributes uh, causes slower convergence uh, in such settings. <clears throat> Now, uh, this uh, type of behavior also provides an explanation for why you perform feature normalization. Now, in the previous lecture, we discussed feature normalization where the typical approach is to perform standardization uh, over the different attributes. So, in standardization, what we do is that we make the standard deviation of each feature to be the same. Each feature will have unit standard deviation after you normalize it. So, uh, why does this matter? Now, note that uh, even though the sensitivity of the loss function will depend on the exact relationship of the loss function to the different features, the reality is that if the features are on very different scales, one feature will naturally tend to have a very different sensitivity to the, to the loss function. So, imagine you had a setting where you had two attributes. One attribute was age and the other attribute was salary. Now, age is typically in one or two digits, where salary is typically in five or six digits. So, there's an order of magnitude difference between these two features. What you'll find is that for most reasonable loss functions, it will be far more sensitive to the age as compared to the salary. So, uh, here in the case of the elliptical bowl, for example, the, the age will be the, like the Y attribute and the salary will be like the X at attributes. And that will cause more bouncing. That is one of the reasons uh, why you perform feature normalization because it helps even out the gradient ratios to some extent. Of course, the exact behavior depends on the nature of the target variable, but in the absence of any information about uh, the target variable and its relationship to the feature variables, this seems like a reasonable thing to do. Now, a very extreme manifestation of this varying sensitivity to different features occurs in deep networks. What happens in very deep networks is that the weights in different layers, they tend to have very widely varying magnitude. And with increasing depth, this effect is magnified. So in, in these cases, the, the partial derivatives, they either continuously increase with depth or they continuously decrease with depth. So let us look at why this occurs. So here I have given uh, an example of a neural network with exactly one node per layer. Now, obviously we know that most neural networks have more than one node per layer, but looking at one node per layer is the best way of understanding as to why the vanishing and exploding gradient uh, descent happens. So here in each case, uh, you have a, a weight value between a single scalar weight value between two layers and you have an activation function. So the forward propagation, it multiplicatively depends on each weight and activation function evaluation. But the real issue is what happens during backward uh, propagation, because during the backward propagation, that's where you are computing the gradients. So typically what's going to happen is that it, it, in each backward propagation, if you look at the back propagation equations, what you'll be doing is that you'll be multiplying by the weights and the activation function derivatives. So unless the product of these two values is exactly one, Typically, it will not be exactly one. Typically, they'll, they'll all be either less than one or they'll all be either more than one. So what, what is going to happen is that the partial der derivative will, will either continuously increase a, 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 as, as you go back during back propagation, which is called an explosion of gradients, or they will continuously decrease, which is called a vanishing of gradients. So what is going to happen is that when you update your neural networks, even if you update by a very large amount in the uh, in, in, in the later layers, what's going to happen in the early layers, your, your finite updates, they are going to be very small. So your updates are going to become very slow and the convergence will become uh, extremely slow. The other problem is that here we saw that unless the product of the two values, the product of the weight as well as the activation derivative is exactly one, uh, typically you'll have some level of instability. So it's very hard in most of these cases to initialize the weight exactly right. Uh, 
Now here, of course, we have shown an example with scalar weights, but the same problem will generally occur even when you use uh, uh, multiple nodes. So, so in certain types of networks, you can show that it depends on the eigenvalues of the matrix uh, matrices of weights. Now, uh, <clears throat> now, now for certain activation functions they have a larger propensity to vanishing gradients as compared to exploding gradients uh, why is this uh, the reason is that let's look at the sigmoid activation function now the partial derivative of the sigmoid with output o is o1 minus o now if you look at this function this function at o is equal to 1 that's one extreme of the sigmoid value this value is 0 and at o is equal to 0 also this is 0 the maximum value occurs right in the middle at o is equal to 0 0.5 so if you substitute o is equal to 0 0.5 in this expression you get a maximum value of the partial derivative of 0 0.25 so what it means is that just the effect of the activation function alone when you are back propagating if you have 10 layers it's it's going to get multiplied by something less than 0 0.25 to the power of 10 so just the activation function alone will co contribute a multiplicative factor of 10 to the power of minus 6 and unless the multiplicative weights uh, effect of the weights compensates for this uh, what is going to happen is that your gradients are going to vanish the other problem in the case of the sigmoid function is that when you have extremes of output values, so when your output is close to either 0 or 1, this partial derivative, this O1 minus O is also very close to 0. This is called saturation. So uh, even if you compensate the weights uh, in such a way, very often because one of the activation functions is very close to its extremes, this type of saturation will occur which will cause slow training. It will cause vanishing gradients. Now, uh, the, the Tanner activation function is slightly better than the sigmoid because uh, its partial derivative has a maximum value of 1 rather than 0 0.25 but you still have the problem of saturation because it's never going to take on its maximum value and only it requires only a few of them to take on small values in order to kill the gradient as you back propagate backward. Now, of course, uh, the backpropagated gradients, they, they don't depend only on the activation function. They also depend on the weight. So one way you can handle this problem is to initialize the weights to larger values uh, to compensate for the activation functions. Now, uh, one thing that you saw is that the weights, uh, in, in the previous lecture, we discussed how weights are initialized. They're initialized somewhat carefully. And the way those initializations are done is to ensure that neither uh, vanishing nor exploding gradients occur because uh, if you initialize the weights to very large values it can actually cause exploding gradients uh, so uh, and exploding gradients also occurs in some other interesting settings where the weights across different layers are shared as you'll see in later lectures uh, in recurrent neural networks because the weights across uh, different layers are shared the effect of a finite change in the weight when you actually perform the gradient descent step it is extremely unpredictable across different layers so what can happen is that if you make a small change in the uh, in, in in the weight the the loss might change negligibly but suddenly, but if, if you increase it slightly more, suddenly the loss might change drastically. This type of topology, it is referred to as a cliff. And cliffs also cause a problem for gradient descent because uh, if you take very small steps, you don't move at all. But if you take a very large step, uh, this type of overshooting can occur, which causes the training, the, the nature of the convergence uh, to become more difficult uh, when you have this type of setting. Now, uh, there are some uh, simple fixes uh, to the vanishing and exploding gradient uh, descent problems. In this lecture, we won't discuss the more advanced types of fixes, but we'll discuss some of the simpler ones. So one is that in recent years, uh, it has become more popular to use these piecewise linear activation uh, functions, such as the ReLU or the hart tanner So for example, the ReLU, it has a linear activation for non-negative values or otherwise sets its outputs to, uh, to zero. Uh, 
so uh, so so the relu it has a partial derivative of 1 at least for non negative in input so at least in a fairly large range uh, it functions uh, with a partial derivative of 1 which doesn't contribute to the vanishing gradient problem uh, however one problem is that sometimes what can happen is that it can have a partial derivative of 0 with respect to all uh, training instances and in such cases uh, this neuron will never get updated so it won't even contribute to the learning in any way and this neuron is essentially dead uh, this type of situation uh, is referred to as brain damage in biological parlance and what it means is that certain parts of your neural network they become useless so now obviously you don't want very large parts of your neural network to become inactive in this way so there are certain fixes uh, to 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 this type of problem one of which is called the leaky relu now note that in the relu you set the activation function value to 0 when the argument uh, is negative in the leaky relu you set this uh, set it to alpha v so you still allow some of, you still allow some amount of uh, some propagation of gradient backwards but at a reduced rate and this value of alpha is less than 1 it's a hyperparameter chosen by the user uh, but of course you can also learn it now the gains with the leaky relu are not guaranteed Uh, another solution that is used is called max out so in max out it's like you you're really using two neurons uh, with weights w1 and w2 and then you are taking the maximum of their output so you can see w1 dot x and w2 dot x so there are two coefficient vectors so this max out is actually a generalization of the relu because if you set one of the weight vectors for example w2 to 0 you're going to get max w1x 0 which is exactly the relu uh, and even the leaky relu can be simulated by the other coefficient vector to w2 is equal to alpha w1 and the main disadvantage of course with the max out is that it doubles the number of parameters now for exploding gradient uh, problem also you have uh, the you have some fixes one fix is, is that you try to make the components of the different partial derivative more even with value based clipping so 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 one thing that you do in value based clipping is that all partial derivatives outside particular range is set to range boundary so that way the ratio is not very different norm based clipping is a bit different because it doesn't look at the ratio of the different partial derivatives so you what you do is that you normalize the entire gradient vector by the l2 norm of the vector so so by doing these things you can achieve better conditioning of the value so that the updates from mini batch to mini batch are roughly similar and it prevents an anomalous gradient explosion during the course of the training so uh, some other comments on uh, vanishing and exploding gradients one is that uh, we only discuss some simple methods for uh, handling vanishing and exploding gradient methods in fact uh, even uh, issues like the simple feature normalization and proper weight initialization are, are important in order to avoid the vanishing and exploding gradient problems but there are other fixes that are discussed uh, in later lectures uh, one of them is uh, that you can do stronger initial initialization with pre training uh, where, where where you start with a more carefully trained version of the weights uh, with you use un wise learning to pre train the weights the second is that you can use second order learning methods now note that uh, when we discuss the example of the elliptical bowl and the circular bowl one thing that you might have noticed is that the varying curvature of the loss function has a significant effect uh, on these type of problems so for example even if you look at the example of the cliffs you can see that the curvature suddenly changes at, at certain points and this type of varying curvature can only be captured if you use the second derivative of the loss function so uh, so second order learning methods are often useful in such settings and uh, they will be discussed in a later lecture